If you'll go ahead and turn to John chapter 9. We're moving right along in our study of John. John chapter 9 will be tonight. I do want to do a very quick review of John chapter 8. Uh, I know there was a lot in John chapter 8. And um, I was actually very surprised we actually made it through John chapter 8 in one week. Um, but in John chapter 8, um, we see that Jesus goes up to the Mount of Olives. Uh, and then He goes into the temple. And we see them bring this woman out, um, caught in the act of adultery. We talked about how they had violated the law of Moses in order to, um, to bring her to Him. And I also wanted to note that um, Jesus, whenever He is confronting the uh, Pharisees and the religious leaders, whenever He's confronting them, what does He say about who they claim to be their father? They say it's Abraham. And they say they're followers of Moses. Now they're followers of God. But what does He say about all of those people? Abraham, Moses, and God. What does Jesus say about those those um, people that, that He brings up? That they bring up? And I'll kind of Go ahead. In John 8, verses 56, he said, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was very glad. Yeah, so he says, Abraham rejoiced to see me whenever my day came. We also see in John chapter 7, you've got to back up a little bit more, um, in John chapter 7, and starting in verse about um, 18. Well, 17, if anyone is willing to do His will, and that is talking about God the Father, if anyone is willing to do His will, He will know of the teaching, whether it's of God or whether I speak of myself. So we see this idea that God has put His approval upon Christ. We have Abraham has put His approval upon Christ. And then if you go on down in John chapter 7, in verse 19, it says, Did not Moses give you the law, and yet none of you carries out the law? Why do you seek to kill me? So again, he is even saying the very man that you um, are talking about, you're not even uh, listening to the law that he gave you. And then in verse 22, for this reason Moses has given you circumcision, not because from Moses, but from the fathers, and on the Sabbath you circumcise a man. So he talks about how they are looking at Jesus kind of with a crooked eye and doing all of these healings, on the Sabbath day and doing all of these things on the Sabbath day and, and they continue to say he's violating uh, the Sabbath. Go ahead, Nancy. Well, also I think in, in all of these chapters in different places, he actually tells them, these people are testifying of me. If you had heard the testimony, you'd know who I am. Yeah, over and over again. And the reason for that is because of what John laid as the foundation of his book in John chapter 1, and that is Christ is the Word come to earth. And so everything that you read about in the Old Testament, it has now been manifested through Christ. And so that's why he continues to make, you know, you can point back to whoever you want to. They are all pointing towards me. And we're going to see a little bit more of that in John chapter 9 when he starts talking about the prophets as well a little bit later on. Let's go ahead and see where we left off here in, in John chapter 8. Um, in verse uh, 52, um, I'm, I'm sorry, we'll, we'll back up to verse 51. Truly I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. The Jews said to him, we now know that you have a demon. Abraham died, and the prophets also, and you say if anyone keeps my word, he will never taste of death. In other words, what they're saying is, you're trying to make yourself out to be greater than those guys. They're dead, they're gone, and you're saying all I have to do is follow your word, and I'll, and I'll never see death. And so, again, they're looking at something very temporal, but yet Christ is trying to point them towards what? Spiritual things. Spiritual things. 
In verse 53, Surely you are not greater than our father Abraham who died. The prophets died too. Whom do you make yourself out to be? So who are you if you are greater than they? And Jesus answered, If I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my Father who glorifies me. Uh, what you say, He is our God, and you uh, have not come to know Him, but I know Him. And if I say I do not know Him, I'll be a liar just like you are. But I do, not, but I do know Him, and I keep His word. And that seems to be the definition of one who knows God is one who keeps His word. And we'll see that through kind of sprinkled throughout the book of John. But he says, so the Jews said to him, you are not yet 50 old years old, and have you seen Abraham? I'm sorry, back up. Verse 56, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad, as was um, pointed out. And then in verse 57, so the Jews said to him, you're not yet 50 years old, and you've seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, truly I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. And then they picked up stones, and they wanted to stone him. Now again, we pointed out that they didn't want to stone him because he said, I'm really old. He made a very clear declaration of who he was because that was their question. Who do you make yourself out to be? And he answered them. And they didn't like the answer. Now, the story continues on because it says they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. Chapter 9, as he passed by, he saw a man uh, blind from birth. So the story kind of continues, the thought process continues in what John has in store for us. Alright, so for those of you who haven't read John chapter 9, what miracle is about to take place? I'm sorry, what? Yeah, the blind man is about to see. Now this is a man who was born, um, born blind. And why is this miracle so fascinating? Well, maybe we ought to get to the story because I've kind of explained it to you. So. As he passed by, he saw a man uh, blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he would be born blind? What is the assumption that the disciples have about this man? About this man's blindness? There was sin involved. Somebody's sin, either his sin, the parents' sin, somebody's sin was involved. Now, remember how we kind of have our preconceived ideas of who God is and how God operates. The same thing with the disciples here. And this sounds a lot like their, the reasoning that you hear a lot in Job, if you kind of go back to Job. All these bad things happen to you. Why? Because you did something bad. Well, that uh, is not the truth in Job, and it's not the truth here also. So, what did Jesus say was the purpose of this man's blindness? The works of God should be revealed in him. It is so the works of God might be revealed in him. And so, um, and, and we see that in verse, uh, verse 3, but it was so the works of God might be displayed in him. And then he makes this statement along with that, we must work the works of him who sent me as long as it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. And so there's going to come a time when all of these things that's going on now are going to come to an end. That's really kind of what he's saying. All right. So the question comes in here, whenever this happens, please note a few things. What Jesus does, what the man does. In verse, um, verse 5, While I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle and applied the clay to his eyes. So, what did Jesus do? First of all, he walked by and then this conversation happens. Spat on the ground. Spat on the ground. He made clay. Puts it on his face. And then he tells the guy to do something and that is go wash in the pool of Siloam which is translated sent. So he went his way and washed and came back seeing. Now, I don't know how far away he was. I don't know how he got there. I just know that Jesus puts this clay on the man's eyes. And what does the guy do? Who is this? What, what's going on here? Huh? He just does it. Yeah, he just does it. And, go ahead. Uh, 
I know you got the last one to do. I'm going to back up one. Okay. At two. And his disciples asked him, say, Rabbi, who sent this matter? No. I did a mystery. Oh, I'm sorry. Verse 4. Mm -hmm. Let's do that one again. We must work the works of Him who sent me while it is day, night is coming, when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And then after He says these things, that's whenever He does this work. It is my understanding that what He's referring to is there's going to come a point in time that these miracles are going to kind of come to an end. Well, that's the works. That's the works that He's talking about because it's, it, it specifically says, as long as I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. And then verse 6, having said these things, he spit on the ground, so he did something for the guy. I had another interpretation, but it was that great. Okay. Uh, and that's open to discussion because, again, that's just my understanding of that. And I'm looking at the immediate context of it, and there may be a broader context that I don't know about. No, that's it. Thank you. All right, so as we move on... Um, we do see that the guy doesn't question anything. It doesn't say that he does. It just says that he goes and he washes. The question I had in verse 2, or I'm, I mean, I'm sorry, number 2, how do you think he um, felt traveling with a muddy face all the way to the pool of Salon? <laughs> you couldn't see? You know? <laughs> couldn't see? Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Did it really matter? <laughs> Go ahead. I think he went on his way hopeful that Jesus delivered hope. Right. Very good. And we see grace being given here. And I, you know, I wanted to point that out also, is that it is unmerited favor. They just so happen to be walking by this guy, and someone points him out and says, who do you think had to sin here? Well, just so you know, it has nothing to do about sin. It's so the grace of God, or the uh, works of God can be manifested in it. And so, it's a very good point. You know, maybe, maybe something's happening here that you know. And then I ask, how do you feel after he washed his face? Amazed. <laughs> yeah, rejoicing. Yes. Yeah, you know, a great work has been done for him. And it certainly was outside of the sphere of any kind of medical technology of the time or anything like that. So we see that here this, um, this man is and was born blind and obviously everybody knew of him because we'll see that here shortly. That, who is this guy? Go ahead. Uh, um, this is just me. I've always wanted to think that you know he made man out of the dust of the earth. So he just made him in his eyes. That's a good that's a good thought. That's a very good thought. But it shows Jesus' control over all things that is around him, you know, because he created all things, and it, you know, it's a good point. All right, so here we see he goes and he washes the pool of Siloam in verse 7. He went and washed and he came back seeing. Verse 8, therefore, because of this, the neighbors and those who previously saw him as a beggar were saying, Is not this the one who used to sit in bed? Others were saying, this is he. Still others were saying, no, but it's like him. He kept saying, I am the one. So, what is it? What do you think his neighbors, and number three, what do you think his neighbors and those who had seen him begging failed to recognize him after he'd been healed? Why? Well, they go from not being able to see to suddenly being able to see and walk out around with no help or anything. That's, that's a pretty big change. Yeah. It's a very big change. And do you think that, you know, maybe instead of stumbling, he's actually walking with, you know, some confidence of what he actually sees? Now, it's interesting that what was this man in for his entire life? Darkness. Darkness. Jesus makes this statement in the middle of this, well, I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world, and that's when he did this. What did he bring to this man's life? Light. And so we, you know, I think that that's why this uh, miracle, John chose this miracle in order to put in here so that we could see more than he just healed a blind man, but that he's able to heal people who were in darkness so they can see light. 
And we see him kind of describe that as we continue on in John chapter 9. So this great glorious thing has been, I got you Clint, has been done. Um, and so we see that people aren't able to recognize him because maybe he's walking a little faster than he normally does, you know, whatever it is, there's something different about him. Go ahead, Clint. Just a couple of things. Uh, and one, the physical, about his appearance, you know, when we look at people, uh, we're always looking at each other's eyes. That's the first thing we do, you know, and so it's understandable that, you know, maybe this man's eyes, eyelids, they could have been disfigured because he was blind from birth, you know, so he may look different. But uh, the other thing, though, is that Jesus has healed other people, you know, without touching him, without doing anything. So this was clearly on purpose, right? right. Going back to verse 3, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. You know, so it was, I think it was kind of a show. Make his face dirty, make him go, make him go through the public, go to the wash. And, and then, you know, as you see there, you know, the, it says the neighbors saw him and, and, and began to question, you know, and wondering what's happening. Yeah. And it's for the glory of God. It's for the purpose of who did this to you? And they're going to find out later. And it's going to, you know, become a big scene. But uh, Yeah, and that's what I was going to say. This was not something that was done in private. This was something that becomes very public very fast. Right. And... Um, what we see here is as they're talking, you know, the, a lot of the neighbors are now starting to talk about it. There's some disagreement about whether it's even the guy or not. And they go ask the guy, he goes, yeah, I'm, I'm the guy. So um, in verse 10, so they were saying to him, how then were your eyes opened? You know, kind of explain this to us. And he answered, the man who is called Jesus made clay, anointed my eyes and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and I received sight. They said, where is he? And he said, I, I don't know. Because I left him back wherever he was, you know, I stumbled through to try to get to Siloam. So, guess who hears of this? Yeah, uh-oh. The Pharisees hear of this. And you can kind of understand why they would be hearing of this just because this is something that, you know, again, was done very publicly and he was known. It wasn't, you know, that he was relatively unknown, but they saw him begging daily. So they knew that this guy was, you know, legitimately blind from birth. So they brought to the Pharisees the man who was formerly blind. So he goes up. Verse 14 tells us something, and that is a time frame. And what is it? Sabbath. It was on the Sabbath on the day that Jesus made clay and opened his eyes. That's where a little bit of controversy comes in, right? Is this the first time? And it will not be the last time either. He continues to challenge them and their thinking on what can and cannot be done on the Sabbath. And the main thing that you need to understand is he's doing what? He explains it to us in in um, 4, 5, and 6. He's doing the works of God. Is there ever a time that you should never do the work of God? No, and that's what he's challenging them on. He's doing the works that were given to him by God to do. Any questions so far? Go ahead. Just more of a point to anything else. The Pharisees tried killing two people on that day, but uh, that apparently doesn't count. Yeah. Well, they, I guess they kind of see that as their work of God, but, you know. It, you know, the interesting thing here, again, uh, you know, is that Jesus challenges them uh, on the Sabbath and with something that they cannot deny because they're going to try to. And so the Pharisees also were asking Him again how He received His sight, and He said to them, He applied clay to my eyes, I washed, and I see. You know, I don't really know what they're really looking for other than a reason to accuse Jesus. But it's pretty simple in how this guy received his sight. And that's a lot like us also. There's no reason to complicate things. We know what we need to do. It's just a matter of doing it. 
In verse 16 it says, Therefore some of the Pharisees were saying, This man is not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. That's their accusation. But others were saying, How can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And you see the division that starts to happen. So they said to blind men again, What do you say about him since he opened your eyes? So remember before on their attacks on Jesus and they say that ask around there's none of the Pharisees and scribes that believe that this man is of God so they become the standard now something has happened here and now they're asking questions and who are they asking as to who the standard is now the blind man who do you say he is much no, they don't. And you know, and you know, yeah, exactly. Again, you know, I think it's more of a, a tactic of of uh, trying to make him afraid. You know, and we'll see some of that here shortly. Um, but he gives this answer, and that is, I said he's a prophet. What? They're trying to get this man to deny. Jesus, so it undercuts the actual miracle that is taking place. I mean, the guy himself is sitting questioning who Jesus is. That undercuts everything that's happening here. If mean, he's not saying a man, Jesus did this, and now he's being put on the spot. And he's he's his sight's becoming clear. Hey, he's a problem. And you're not going to convince me otherwise. Right. You will, and I wanted to kind of point that out because as his testimony kind of wraps up and John chapter 9 wraps up, we see his faith and his belief in Christ grow. And as you said, there's kind of these stages that he's kind of going through. This guy Jesus, now he says, I think he's a prophet. And so we kind of see that changing him also. And as he grows closer to Jesus, what are the Pharisees doing? They're going further away from the truth. And these were supposed to be the guardians of the truth. Right there in itself is an interesting thing. I mean, it's almost like, even for the Pharisees who supposedly still believe in angels and the supernatural, they're the ones questioning this. It's almost, it's been at least according to what we have, it's been half a millennia almost since the prophet's been able to do miraculous signs. So the normal people realize it, and yet the people whose job is to look over these things have forgotten or just don't buy it. Right. Correct. Because of our you know, people that they don't understand, apparently didn't understand the Bible. Chapter 5, verse 15, if you don't mind reading it. It, uh, where it says that they were slaves and he needed the same people that said that they were never under bondage to the man. But I believe it said that um, what is Deuteronomy 5? Deuteronomy chapter 5 and verse 15 says you shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt and the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. I mean, Jesus marveled that um, they didn't understand the concept of rebirth. He was born. Right. He was trying to figure out how to get back in the womb. You know? Very carnally, what 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 right. they see in front of them. I think after Babylon, honestly, I really think Babylon was the worst thing that happened to, to, to the Jews because um, they started getting into all sorts of other things and getting away from the law. You know, and. Uh, well, yeah, you see this progression kind of keep going down further and further until you see where they are now. Okay. Um, let, let me push back on that. Uh, God sent them into Babylon for the purpose of purifying them of idolatry. And the faithful of the ones who were sent over there, the best, were destroyed. You've got Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego as prime examples. So we need to stay away from that one was the worst thing. Now, there are other things that came in, but that one was a good thing as God took them there and purged them of the idolatry that 
Yeah, they continue to call, call, call people back and stuff like that. But yeah, no, I, I agree in that sense. The double one was good for them in the sense that they never got in my dog again. And I also agree that it was, um, it was, it was necessary because they had to be really able to fix them. Okay, you know. But I'm, I'm just saying that there was some stuff that happened in that other one. How let all that other stuff come out of there? That certainly didn't happen. Yeah, you know, I think that what Jesus points out here and probably their problem was even back then, even whenever we see it, um, them coming straight out of Egypt, is they just didn't want to follow what God said and do what God had asked. And um, so I, and he continues to lay that blame on them. He'll continue here in John chapter 9 as well. Um, but that the very words that they hold up as being the truth, they're not even following themselves. I saw another hand go ahead. After Babylon, no more idolatry. Other problems arose, though, and I think that's what uh, Joe's trying to point out is there are other problems that they should have dealt with that they did not deal with. All right, let's move on. John chapter 9, um, whenever he says in uh, verse 17, and he said he is a prophet, verse 18 says, the Jews then did not believe it of him that he had been born blind and that he had received sight until they called the parents of the very one who had received his sight. So now we need testimony about whether or not the guy was even blind or not. So they call the parents in and they start to question them um, and uh, question them saying, is this your son whom you say was born blind? Then how does he now see? So what are they already setting up for their testimony? Trying to get out of it all together. He was even blind. You're saying he's blind. If that's true, how does he see right now? How's that even possible? And now they kind of picked their words very carefully. I asked the question, why do you think they picked it carefully? It actually gives you the answer as to why they picked them carefully. And it says in verse um, 20, his parents answered them and said, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind. But how he now sees, we don't know. Or who opened his eyes, we do not know. Ask him, he's of age, he will speak for himself. And so they're kind of bowing out of this. I don't know anything. Uh, he was blind, he's not blind. You'll need to talk to him how that happened. And then um, it says in verse 22, his parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews. Because this is the decree that has already been given. For the Jews had already agreed that if anyone confessed him to be Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. So, what's going on with this blind man? Why isn't he put out of the synagogue? Because he hasn't gotten there yet. What he said was, he's a prophet. Well, let's call the parents in. The parents go, well, yeah, he's our son. He was born blind. How he sees now, we don't know. We've got to talk to him. Because they're certainly not going to say, well, he told us, this guy, Jesus. Um, so, but we see they uh, actually end up calling him in again. Verse 24, so a second time they called in the man because I guess now they realize that he's old enough to answer for himself, as the parents uh, suggested. Uh, they, uh, time, the second time they called the man in blind. And now listen to what they say to him. They said to him, give glory to God. We know this man is a sinner. What are they wanting him to say? Jesus is a fraud. Jesus is a fraud, and that's how you're going to do what? That's how you're going to give glory to God if you say that he's a sinner, he's a fraud. That, that's really what's going on here. And I looked that up, give glory to God. Uh, it shows up uh, a few times, and I do believe that, there's a, that they're referencing back to maybe one or two of these uh, instances, I, I really don't know. But if um, you want to read in um, Joshua chapter 7, verse 19, then Joshua said to Achan, My son, give glory to the Lord God of Israel and give praise to him and tell me now what you have done. Do not hide it from me. So in other words, in order for Achan to give glory to God, what would he have to do? Confess that he had taken things that he shouldn't have. In other words, you got yeah, you have to make it right. 
And that's what they're saying to him also. Go ahead. Yeah, the, the basic thing they're doing in both those cases, just tell the truth. Yeah. The Pharisees are saying, we, we know the truth already. Now, why, why don't you tell us the truth? You need to honor God, give glory to God by just coming out and telling the truth and saying he's a sinner. Right. Well, look at all the controversy that's caused by this. They've got to get their arms wrapped around this somehow. This guy, Jesus, just keeps doing things like this. And at some point, they have to start attacking him that he's a fraud, he's a sinner, or whatever. And that's exactly what's going on here. They're trying to get the guy to say that this really didn't happen. Go ahead. And you can see the tact tactic of the world is used even to this day. They keep asking the questions until they get the answers that they want. They're not going to stop. They're going to keep asking. They've heard the truth. They know it's the truth. They're not going to let it go. They're going to keep asking questions. That's, that's something that happens today with folks who don't get the answers they want. They just keep answering the question and badgering and badgering. <clears throat> and there's a threat lying over the side about being kicked out of the synagogue that we read about that's going to affect this man later on because he is thrown out and it has an effect on the parents too. So they're, they're using every advantage that they have to try to get this, this uh, uh, blind part of theirs further. Yeah. Well, you know, first of all, they're trying to say, well, what about this? And what about this? And what about this? And now they're at the point, well, he's a sinner. So how is it possible that he can even heal like this? And so, you know, it's just, you know, as you said, just one question after another question after another question, and it's kind of loaded. And, I, you know, I think that this blind man, for lack of a better, I don't mean this anyway, but he sees through this. And, um, you know, and so he answered them. And oh, in verse uh, 24, they asked him a second time, Give glory to God. We know this man is a sinner. Verse 25, he says, He answered them, Whether he's a sinner, I don't know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. That is, the, that is what you are accusing him of. And I can't tell you anything else about him other than I rubbed up against him and, you know, and he had a put some clay in my face, and I went down there to, to the pool of Siloam. I was blind, and now I see. He doesn't stop there uh, with this, because they start questioning him. So they said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? So more questions, more questions, more questions. How can this be? And um, verse 27, he answered them, I told you already, and you did not listen. So what's their problem that Jesus has accused them of, and now the problem that this guy is accusing them of? Somehow he's not telling them the truth. They just don't want to accept the obvious. You know, he's repeated it over and over and over, and they are determined to find some way of misconstruing it so they'll get the answer they want. And yeah. he's, he's like, what, what can I do? I'm telling you. Yeah. <laughs> They're hearing, but they are not listening. Right. And they are just completely denying anything that has to do with this man Jesus and what is, is happening. And Jesus continues to accuse them of that also, and that is they're not listening to the words. Go ahead. Yeah, they, they started down that track of saying, you know, we really don't even believe he was born blind. So really, Jesus didn't do any miracle. Once the parents come in and say, yeah, it's our son who's born blind. Now he sees we don't know who, we don't know how. They were lying through all of that. Now they're not attacked of trying to say Jesus didn't do anything. They're on this track of, okay, he did it, but he's a sinner because he did it on the Sabbath. Right. So, as with many other cases in the New Testament, they can't just dismiss that miracle. They're having to explain to some of the well, those demons that did it, did it on the Sabbath. You know, it's just unrighteous in doing these things. Right. Well, and, and I think that's where we kind of um, see them kind of continue to get further and further away from the obvious facts, the obvious things, and because they're getting moving away from what is the obvious, they're moving further away from what the truth is, and that is the words that are being spoken to them. 
And that's exactly what this guy says is that I've already told you. I've already spoken those words. You're not listening, though. Go ahead. This happens again with the apostles. I mean, when they heal the lame man on Solomon's porch. I mean, that's the thing they talk to themselves about. We can't deny it happened. We know the guy was lame. We know he was walking. We can't deny the miracle happened. we got to shut him up somehow. Yeah. And that's exactly what they're trying to do here. Well, this guy, this blind guy, again, I, you know, he kind of sees through this, and what he says is this. Um, I told you already not to listen. Why do you want to hear it again? You do not want to become his disciples, do you? <laughs> why are you so interested in it? I mean, what happened? How, why, why are you so interested? Go ahead, John. Well, he has a good heart, this guy. And he, he has some knowledge, you know, because he was, he was actually teaching them later on a little bit about it. He said, you know, who can, who can do this kind of stuff? And God, we know God is Muslim sinners. And, I mean, he was telling them all this stuff that made him even angry because all this stuff, how are we doing with telling them? Uh, yeah, exactly. How dare you? You know, and the interesting thing is we kind of see this guy progress a little bit closer to Jesus because when he makes that statement, you do not want to be his disciples also, what's he kind of whose camp is he kind of putting himself in? He's squarely in Christ's camp. Correct. Is he he is not the least bit intimidated by these guys. In fact, he's he's taking out that sword and he's sticking them right in the heart. You know. Hey, who who do you guys, you know, you're, you're sitting here pressuring me, you're asking these questions about him, and that sarcasm is just so powerful. Hey, do you want to be his disciples? And there are other people we need to understand witnessing yeah. this unfolding. Yeah. It, again, a very public thing. His, where he's coming from, first of all, we know that he probably you know, is starting to see for the first time their ploy or what they're trying to do. And so why are you continuing to question me about this? Do you also want to be his disciples? Notice them. They reviled him and said, you are his disciples, but we are disciples of Moses. So again, he's put himself, we've gone beyond this guy Jesus. We've gone beyond um, the prophet, now he's basically saying that he is a disciple, he's a follower of him. And so we see him kind of progress along and they are now completely um, separating themselves and said, you know, who do you think that you are? You are his disciples, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he is from. So, and those are the very things that we talked about previous where Jesus said, Moses spoke of me, you just need to look into his words to see me. And you're not able to see me because you're in darkness, I'm the light, and we see that all kind of played out in John chapter 1. What did the darkness do to the light? Could not comprehend it, so they tried to extinguish it. And so all of this is kind of starting to play out. They're trying to extinguish that light that's being given to, uh, to the world. Well, and in this statement here where they're like, uh, where they talk about Moses here. I mean, Christ has already referred to him about this. He, he tells them, you guys, you know, you're doing the tombs of the prophets saying that if we were in the days of our father, we wouldn't have done this to him. But you're just saying you're their kids. Oh, yeah, exactly. To the children of murderers. So they're not helping their case here. Right. Well, and he further Especially drives... With what the, yeah, with what he gives them next, he further takes the, the sword and really kind of starts slicing them. And he says, the man answered and said, well, in verse 30, well, here's an amazing thing, that you do not know where he is from, and yet he opened my eyes. In other words, you are now the ones who have become blind. And in verse 31, we know that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is God-fearing and does His will, He hears him. Since the beginning of time, it has never been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not of God, he could do nothing. I'm going to tell you something. When Jesus said this man was born blind to bring about God's will, this is what he's talking about. Because this guy has just 
turned their, I mean, he, he has just bulldogged them and into the dirt. I mean, you know, you continue to say that he's a sinner. I'm telling you, God does not hear sinners. He doesn't listen to them. But yet, this man continues to do all of these things and you simply will not listen. You won't um, do the things that of God. And he says, now I'll, here's the evidence. Since the beginning of time, show me one example of any of the prophets anywhere ever healing the blind and causing them to see. He, there in verse 30, he, he's attacking their elitism, their supposed intellect, their insight. You know, what? Is this a marvelous thing? You, you don't know where he's from? Another way to put it that we might put it in our modern language is how stupid can you be? Right. That I'm standing here living proof that you you can't not and, and you can't accept that? You, you're com trying to go completely opposite of that? No. So it, it like you said, this is this is cutting them off at the knees and it is humiliating them in front of everyone here. Yeah, and and obviously he, what he says has an effect on them. Because their answer, and we and I want to go over verse 31, we know that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is God fearing and does his will, he hears him. So it's important to note that because in the religious world, what do you have? What type of prayer do they say you have to pray? The sinner's prayer, and that's it. But what we see here, this man actually debunks that when he says God does not hear sinners, but if you are willing to obey His will and do His will, God will hear you then. Go ahead. And let's keep this in a specific context. They're claiming Jesus is a sinner, therefore the miracle is invalid. He's coming back in that line of argument and <clears throat> saying He cannot be a sinner and do something like Correct. this. That that's just not possible, and it goes to this point of um, people who are not in harmony with God's will, then, now, or ever, cannot do any kind of miracle. This it's that's not happening. Now, when you fast forward into Cornelius's life, it talks about in Acts 10 that his prayers is, have been heard by God, and that's the answer. So there. Sometimes I think we draw way too hard of a line on this that there are people who are seeking God. And God hears that. God knows that. God works it out in His providence for them to come to Him. Right. Um, when we are in sin and we ask God for forgiveness, God hears that appeal for forgiveness. Right? But in this context, He's basically saying, how can you say this man is living in rebellion to God and performs a miracle like this? It can't happen. Correct. And you know, even when it, in the case of Cornelius in Acts chapter 10, it says that he was God-fearing. And he was doing the works that he knew to do of God. Mm -hmm. And you know, so whenever honest people are confronted with the truth, you only have one or two ways. You either remain honest or you become dishonest. And you know, and I, and, I, and I agree that he's taking their, what they stated, and that is this man is a sinner, and what he's saying is, if he was a sinner, how is he capable of doing this? There's just no way. And so, now remember what he said before, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't really know. Well, now he's become even more convinced by just this argument that he's saying, well, now that you mention that, he can't be a sinner. Because God doesn't hear that. Only those who does His will. And will God hear? And he goes on to say, since the beginning of time, there's never been heard anyone open the eyes of a person who was born blind. That is a, an emphatic statement of where he thinks Jesus is, or who he thinks Jesus is. Because their question that they had in John chapter uh, 8, before they wanted to stone him, they asked Jesus, we follow Moses and um, Abraham our father, and they 
have died, are you greater than they? Who do you say you are? And he gives that statement. Well, what this guy is saying is, check it out. Moses didn't do it. Abraham didn't do it. Look at all the prophets. None of them ever healed the blind. So he's putting um, Jesus above those guys. Go ahead. And right there is a very interesting point because he's now, when Jesus in chapter 8 was telling them they were wrong, the blind man is proving to them that they're wrong using the scripture. Yeah. And they don't like the answer. Well, yeah, and you know, we'll even see even more where they um, talk a little bit in, in John chapter 10. He's tracking right now at the heart of their power, which is their supposed expertise. They know, the law. They know this is true. Correct. In verse 35, oh, I'm sorry, in verse 34, they answered, you were born entirely of sins, and you are teaching us, so they put him out. See how quickly that happens? Boom, just you're out. And it doesn't seem to really affect him much. Go ahead, Steve. This, this is a great example of how within a family, you, you can't say, well, that whole family is like that. Right. The, the parents had the same evidence. Now, granted, the miracle wasn't performed on them, but that was their baby boy. What parent would not be absolutely ecstatic and beside themselves and be right in the same camp with their son? But we see these people are. They, they end up lying and denying and getting away from the truth that is staring them in the face. Their son, though, he's completely different. And it helps us to see, we, we judge people individually. The parents aren't like the children. Right. Children aren't like their parents. parents. It, right. Look how they've reacted. Yeah, very good. Quickly. One of the things that I see here is the, the chances that Jesus is trying to give these people who he's in so much conflict with. A couple chapters later, we're going to see the death of Lazarus and mm. that whole miracle there. And, and that's an escalation to this, <laughs> right? Yeah. You know, so the, the man says, nobody's ever made somebody that's born blind see. Nobody's raised somebody from the dead. You know, it's, Jesus keeps trying, keeps poking the bear also, though, about this whole Sabbath thing, just to try to get them to think, to get them to open up to the truth. But they continually shut him down. They continually, as you already kind of opened up with the class, was they were they continued to divide themselves further and further away. That's right. Well, and even with the well, we'll talk about Lazarus later, but you still have Elijah who raised the the widow's son. And and that's why I believe that this one miracle is in here that John records because it is the only um, time that we see this ever recorded of, of someone being born blind. This isn't the last time that Jesus heals the blind either. Go ahead. Well, to me, as we've worked our way from seven over here into nine, if you go back to seven and verse 12, it's a very simple statement. However, no one spoke open and openly of him for fear of the Jews. Yeah. And the Bible is its own commentary. We have just read the commentary about what that verse means. Right. Even when Nicodemus spoke up and said, well, do we try a man without actually hearing him? And they immediately turned to him and said, well, are you from Galilee? Yeah, you ready to leave? take his side? <laughs> All right. And, I mean, just that completely explains verse 12. This is why people did not. These people didn't have a choice. They got drug in there. Right. And his parents paid, but he didn't. Right. He's just speaking the truth and, you know, his experience in this. All right, moving on, uh, it does say uh, Jesus heard that they had put him out. And guess what Jesus does? Goes to seek him, goes to find him. Why do you think he does that? Because he appreciates that the man stood up and recognized who he was. <laughs> yep, and we're going to see yet another step in this man's faith as well. So... He heard that they had put him out, and finding him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, Who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? So this man is also seeking. Christ is seeking him. He's seeking Christ. This meeting happens, 
And Jesus said, you have both seen him, and he is the one talking with you. The very next verse says, and he said, Lord, I believe. Now that is why this book was even written, why these miracles occurred, why they were written down for us. And this guy had this miracle performed on him, and he said, yes, I believe. And it was obvious that he believed and that that seed kind of broke out and started to continue to grow in him just in a in a very short amount of time. And as he sees the Pharisees resisting what the truth is, I think that's what pushes him further towards the truth. And that's what we have to kind of keep in mind is as error continues to kind of force its way a lot of times what error does in their overcorrection for trying to make the truth unknown to people, they end up creating a situation where more people come to the truth because more evidence starts to show out. He says uh, in verse 38, and he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. So he is completely and fully where he needs to be now. Mike, here you have a guy whose eyes are open. He now sees... He tells Jesus he believes in Him. The first, very first thing that he does is he worships, worships the Lord. What an example that is to us. If our eyes are open, we're going to worship the Lord. We're going to worship Him every time that we possibly can. And we're going to try to do everything that we can to live a life according to the Gospel. Just like this man did immediately when his eyes were open. Very good. In verse 39, Jesus said, For judgment I came into this world, so that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. Those of the Pharisees who were with Him heard these things and said to Him, We are not blind too, are we? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no sin. But since you say, We see, your sin now still remains. So, and that kind of wraps up this story about the blind man. And what he says in here, and I believe that John chapter 10 is a continuation of the thought of what he just says, but what does Jesus say about the blind and those who are not blind? Well, the blind sin could see, and those who weren't blind and those who now, I'm going to refer you back to a question. John chapter 9 and verse 2. What's the question? He's, he's saying back in, in verse 2 that their assumption was because he has a physical problem, there was sin involved. And now Jesus, at the end of chapter 9, saying the exact opposite of what their belief is, is that if you were blind, then you would not have sin. Correct. But because you're, you can see, you have sin now. Right. And so they they completely, you know, probably turn their heads in, in disbelief at this because they're, you know, surely we were right before that there was sin involved. And so that they're getting another lesson on top of a lesson. Yeah. And that you got to listen to him. you got to really hear what he says because he's going to tell you things that you need to hear. Yeah. But this whole thing is being kind of wrapped up with who really ends up being blind? And why are they blind? And it says in verse 41, if you were blind, you would not see. But since you say, since you say we see, your sin still remains with you. You're still blind. Go ahead. They're, they're in the position of we believe we are righteous. And he's basically pointing out to them no. Because of that attitude, you, you're not willing to examine mirror. yourself to even think that you could be wrong. You're, you're in sin. Correct. And you can't even see it. Go ahead. That's all. This week is one of the longest narratives that John has in here. I'm not sure whether they brought the blind man into the synagogue the same day or the day after, but 
this has been continuing for some time, ever since they he was teaching before they tried stone and disappeared on the trip to the blind man. But it's the same thought the whole way through. They're blind because they're willful. The leaders are blind because they're willfully blind. Right. And we see that with what has just been happening. Right. But I do find it interesting that even despite all that and being thrown out, you still have a couple of Pharisees still hanging around Jesus. Yeah. You see what happens, I guess, next to report back. Um, what you'll see also, and I do want, I'm do i glad you brought that up about this whole narrative and Jesus' teachings. What you see in John, we don't know a lot about it. If you read just John, you wouldn't know a whole lot about his apostles because his focus is upon those miracles and upon the teaching that God does or that Jesus does about the kingdom of God to come and about who he is. And that's why we, we see that, um, you know, this kind of continuation of the of the, the thought. There's nothing else I'm gonna go to close class with a little past time. Thank you.